Welcome to Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. Whether you're 25 or 45, there's bound to be a discussion that you care about. Our mission is to share practical ways to find God in your everyday life. And now today's host, Chris Lang. So often we've heard the saying, forgive and forget. But is this really logical? The Bible says God forgets our sins when we confess them. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, the Bible says, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. But how does an all-knowing, all-powerful God forget? Well, He simply chooses not to act on the knowledge of our past. In the same way, the Scriptures call believers everywhere to forgive those who sin against them. But forgiving does not mean destroying the memory of the past. Rather, it's a conscious refusal to allow the past to absorb one's attention and impede our progress. Leaving the past behind is very difficult, but it is possible through the power of God. Hello, my name is Chris Lang, and today is the first part of a two-part series called Forgive and Remember. We want to share how forgiveness can help you move on in life and how it can enable you to share the scars of your past without bitterness. I want to introduce the people in the studio with me today. Uh, I'm happy to have Sabine Vitell as co-host today on this program. This is a really incredible program, Sabine. I feel honored to be here. As do I. (laughs) Um, All the way from Southern California is a good friend of mine, Jennifer Collins. Jennifer has a master's degree in school counseling and is currently working on another master's degree. Yes. A master of divinity degree at Fuller Theological Seminary in Southern California. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Chris. Now, this is a story that has profoundly affected my life, and I just know that it's also going to affect our listeners today. If anyone has a reason to hold a grudge, it was you, Jennifer. This is not a story of an everyday offense. This is about murder. Uh, I met your sister, Julie, the summer of my senior year in college. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I met Julie, I found out very quickly that she was active, she was fun to be with, life of the party, and also very hospitable very very um, uh, welcoming uh, at the house whenever I would go over there for group get-togethers and also that she was very spiritual what was Julie to you being your sister well how much time do we have (laughs) (laughs) Julie for me was not just my older sister she was she was my best friend she was my hero she was my travel partner Um, she was She was who I wanted to be like. And um, I think what really struck me the most was the fact that she was so compassionate for others and and Christ-like. And that, to me, was, was, I think, what really made her my hero. Hmm. Well, there was was an experience that changed the rest of your life that that began some years ago. Why don't you start us through that? Uh, in that process of of her finishing college and what happened uh, from there? Okay, well, in 1991, she graduated um, from Andrews University with a a BS in health psychology. And and from there, she felt led by God to move to the Sacramento area in California, where she was a mental health worker. And um, she was looking forward to adventure there and just knowing that God was a part of her life and, and leading her for her passion to help others overcome addictions and just their life challenges. That's, that was at the core of her heart of helping other people. And while she was there, she started working at, at a hospital, a, mm-hmm. a behavioral health hospital. Correct. And she met someone there, didn't she? She did. She was on an overnight uh, suicide watch, which had her out in the hallway all night with an individual um, on the other side of the door who was uh, in crisis. And on the, sharing that hallway with her, <laughs> also working as a, a behavioral health worker that evening, was a tall, dark, handsome gentleman who was also um, had the same responsibilities. So they spent the, that, that night in conversation and um, got to know a lot about each other. And I suppose <laughs> there's not a lot to do when you're sitting out in the hallway uh, doing your job and 
just happened to be across the hall from each other. It probably seemed providential to Julie, didn't it? It, it probably did somewhat, yeah. The, a tall, dark, handsome gentleman. Um, doesn't ha happen every day. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow they, they bonded. They at did. That moment. They they had a lot of time to get to know each other, mm -hmm. and um, he was a very good communicator, and, and she enjoyed the conversation. They both did, and they got to know a lot about each other. Mm -hmm. So soon it, it became more more than just a friendship. It did. It, right. it began to blossom. He uh, kind of wooed her at the same time, mm -hmm. and um, they became friends. Court, you know, interacted a lot together, and mm -hmm. um, things began to develop. As I heard on the phone from from Michigan at that time. Right. But you got to meet this just this gentleman. I did. Um, just a couple months later, I spent a month in California with Julie, and uh, she uh, introduced me to him. Spent some time with him. Admittedly, I wasn't too uh, keen on him. I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't exactly certain that I was um, comfortable mm -hmm. with him dating my sister. Now, how long was it until until a marriage proposal happened? It was, it was about a year. Um, it, it was a little bit. It was a little bit less. Um, mm -hmm. They they had spent a lot of time together. They got to know each other. But the Christmas of '92, they um, they came home and to Michigan to be with my family for Christmas. And um, at that time, in front of my family, he proposed to her. Okay. But now, uh, for you and for your family, there were some red flags that concerned you, even though there was joy, there, there was some uh, tension? There, there were some red flags. Um, prior to this, and uh, prior to the engagement, and then after that as well, he, he would not be around when he had promised to be around, so he would disappear for a, a number of days, and, and he would always come back with these wonderful stories of where he had been, and what he had done, and and woo his way back into her life. And, and he would also just kind of, he wasn't, he wouldn't treat with her with as much respect as, okay. as I would have liked. Okay. So there was a time that following year um, where, where things changed for the rest of your life. Just yeah. a few months later, what happened? Um, it was in July of, of 93 and um, he, had been gone for a period of time and around uh, the 17th of July he came back into her life for one last week and um, unfortunately on the 24th of, of July 1993 he we don't know the circumstances exactly as to what happened but uh, he shot her in the back of the head um, one time and she was killed instantly now uh, we don't have time to go through the, the how how David was caught, mm -hmm. but but ultimately, uh, during the span of a couple days, an amazing set of events transpired uh, that must be providential. It, it, the way that they transpired and finding him with her car, robbing someone else, and it found Julie's body within a day or two. Somehow everything fit together and he was convicted, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Uh, like you said, I, I believe that it was a very providential thing that all of that transpired that didn't drag out a period of time for, for my family and for my parents. But um, within the period of time that, that she was killed, her body was found. Um, she was listed as a Jane Doe. Uh, David, the, the guy that murdered my sister, was indeed arrested um, as he was fleeing, um, probably trying to seek money to fund that that uh, his getting away. He did attempt to rob somebody else and was arrested for that. So fortunately, he was in jail already when her body was discovered and we re we mm -hmm. reported her missing. Mm -hmm. So. And now he was, I didn't mean to, and he yeah. was conv convicted, as you just said. And the interesting part of the story is that you actually got, ha had an opportunity to have a dialogue with David. Uh, I, even before his trial, I mm -hmm. did meet with him um, one time in jail. Mm -hmm. And um, even up, to his trial and then afterwards, he still didn't admit his his fault or his involvement, um, but he was convicted because of enough evidence, circumstantial and otherwise, to 25 to year 25 years to life in prison. Mm. Now, uh, there was an interlude in your own heart, in your own journey, from the time of his conviction until some years later when you started visiting him in prison. What was happening in your spirit during that time after his conviction? What was God doing in your life? Um, he was working in ways that I definitely could never have imagined. Um, between the time when he was arrested to, um, so that was around 94 up until 98, my husband and I, uh, we got married in, in 94. 
the year after my sister was murdered, we had moved to Southern California. And I didn't, I had taken God's presence in my life for granted at mm-hmm. that point. Um, I didn't blame him for what happened to my sister, but I, I was re, um, relying on my own inner strength and just kind of taking for granted that God had given that to me. And I started realizing, though, in Southern California that I was really feeling alone. I was missing my sister, and I started to rely on God mm-hmm. and allowing his presence to somehow work within my life. And I spent more and more time with him as I felt inner transformation. But forgiveness was never, ever <laughs> on my mind. Um, my mom and I had visited David in prison mm-hmm. a number of times, um, hoping to find answers. What, what had yeah. happened? Um, hoping maybe he would finally admit something. At first, it was a curiosity <laughs> to, to get information about what happened to Julie, right? It was. Uh, more it was. of a draw to say, what did you do to my sister? Yeah, and hoping, I mean, he knew my family. Um, I had spent time with him. Hmm. Um, he knew that I wasn't going to just keep accepting these, um, <laughs> these as I, they were lies, essentially. <laughs> Bottom line, they were lies that he was telling to my mom. And I also went to protect my mom. I, I didn't want her to keep having to hear um, his promises that he would, you know, share more insight into what happened and then tell us more lies once again. So definitely there was um, a, a no desire to really forgive him at mm-hmm. that point. But over a period of time, I, I began to feel an inner change as I spent more time with God. I can't put a finger on when that changed, but, you know, this thought of forgiveness started coming in and out of my mind Mm -hmm. and it wasn't anything from myself, nothing that I (laughs) put in there and and wanted Mm -hmm. to do or nothing that somebody else said, Hey, you should consider this. Um, so I can really only credit it to God. Mm -hmm. And, um, there came a time in 1998 when my mom and I, um, were going to make a visit with David. And at that point I realized, you know, this is something I really want to do. I want to unconditionally forgive Mm -hmm. him. And even in the middle of him um, crafting some other variation or scenario, mm-hmm. you felt a conviction in your heart that this was the time yeah. that you were going to give it away. Yeah. You were going to cut him loose. Yeah. I was going to free happened? myself from, from his uh, hold. Um, we went there. My mom and I went there on that day. And right from the beginning, it seemed like everything was stacked against us, like we weren't supposed to have this visit, or perhaps somebody didn't want us to have that visit, Um, which I would attribute to Satan really didn't want that forgiveness to happen, knowing how much he had a hold still on me um, by me being a second victim to David. And uh, a lot of little things happened. My mom didn't even get to visit that day. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, some glitches came, and... um, We got to sit down and talk at that point, and uh, David and I spent that time. Stay with us uh, and come, come back after this break, and we'll continue with Jenny's story. You're listening to Hope on Fire. Welcome back to Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. I'm here in the studio today with Sabine Vitell and Jennifer Collins. Welcome back, folks. Thank you. Now we were before the break. We were at this. We were at this moment where uh, you had this tug on your heart to release this murderer yes. who kept lying and changing his story. Um, and 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 looking back, it was a, an incredibly a timely moment for your life and your heart. What happened? Well, we were there at that in that visit, and it, like I had mentioned before, it was really short, and um, I just hadn't felt right that the moment was right at that point, and they said it was quitting time, time to go, visiting hours were over, everybody else was getting up from their chairs, and I felt the moment was right. I, I could feel it inside, and um, I looked him right in the eyes, and I said, David, I forgive you, and this all happened simultaneously, but he reached across the table. He put his hand on mine as I was pushing away from the table. You to, were literally to get leaving the room at that moment. I was leaving. Telling him he, you forgave him. Yeah. And instantaneously, as soon as the words were out of my mouth, I felt such a relief. It, it was like these blocks had just dropped off me, this weight. And wow. I was no longer his victim. Um, there was a peace inside. There was a, a freedom that I hadn't felt um, in quite a while, uh, a peace that... I can only attribute to the 
the love of God just really filling me and, and taking over a spot that, that David had been holding. So that happened in your heart. Physically, mm -hmm. he reached out and, and grabbed your hand. Yeah. What did he say to you? He said, he said, thank you, and I'm sorry for the hurt that I've caused you. And, you know, that's the closest he ever came to admitting that he was involved in my sister's murder. It, that, that was a significant moment for you mm -hmm. because you answered the Holy Spirit's call. What happened to David after that? That was the last time you saw him, wasn't it? It was. The very next year he died in prison, and we're not sure what happened. But, yeah, that was my last opportunity. Mm. And the thought occurred to me as you were telling your story. Mm -hmm. What if you hadn't answered that call at that moment and you're pushing away from the table? He, he, the Lord knew he was going to die. Mm -hmm. You didn't know. Mm -mm. You probably thought next year is another opportunity. No, right. and he speaks about the urgency of forgiveness. Yeah. I, I, I feel very fortunate that I followed the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And, and since then, that's become a pattern I've tried to follow. But in that moment, in trying to look back and say, what, what could have happened if I hadn't? I know that my heart would still likely be bound up by a, an anger at David, especially for not being able to release him. Um, I would like to think that, that God would have helped me to heal if, if I hadn't had the opportunity to speak to him personally. But, you know, in my own, with my own personality, it was important for me to say it to him, to his face. Wow. And, and to, to take that risk to do that. Um, it, but it's different for each person, but that's what was important for me at that moment. And you use the term no longer the second victim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very striking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you, so you felt, you felt peace, healing, and purpose after that. I did. I was moved by your use. Um, by the way, you recently wrote an article that's going to be published soon. Mm -hmm. And you used a text that really expounded on this idea of forgiveness in Matthew 18, verse 21 and 22. Give us how the Holy Spirit impressed that that meaning of first of all, what was the story in Scripture, and secondly, how did it apply in your experience? In that, it's it's talking about where um, how many times are we supposed to forgive? Is it just uh, seven times seven? Mm -hmm. You know, is it is it that simple? And and Christ talks about it being seventy times seven. And to me, I always heard that, and oh yeah, that's nice. It's you know this big number, and just forgive. But in this situation. The, the way that I found it applying to me was that, yes, I forgave David, but for it to be an unconditional forgiveness, it's something that I had to have a complete release of. So now when I remember my sister, um, I can't forget what happened to her and the fact that she's here, but it's a continual release. I'm not bound by what David did to her. So it's a continual conscious decision to um, forgive him. And it no longer has a bound on my life. And um, for me, that's how it applies. It's, a, it's a, that continual forgiveness for what he did to, to my sister. So the old adage, you disagree with the old adage, adage forgive and forget? Because you're actually, <laughs> you're actually remembering what happened without being bitter, aren't you? I am. I'm not remembering the murderer, though. I'm mm -hmm. remembering my sister. And, and that's, for me, what has been the difference is by unconditionally forgiving David, He's really no longer a part of my everyday thinking of my sister. Now I am free to think about her and remember about my memories with her. I, I don't forget what happened to her. That's a part of my life history, a part of her life history. And it makes me a part of who I am today and in understanding how God has worked on my life today. But David's no longer a part of that equation. Mm. Mm -hmm. And for some of us who, you know, I didn't get the, pr the pleasure of meeting Julie, mm -hmm. you know, like, like Chris did, and uh, like myself and others in the audience, when we hear about Julie, it's sort of a redeemed memory of your sister. Mm. Yeah, so in a sense, you're talking about her memory being redeemed from the murder. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the power of the mercy of God, isn't it? Mm -hmm. to, to actually be able to separate those things in your mind and emotion. Uh, let me ask both of you. I am struck. I'm stricken. Is that the right word? <laughs> I'm struck. Strucken, struck. I've been struck. By, <laughs> I've been stricken by the the idea that as I listened and read your story, timetables and the approach to forgiveness aren't always the same. For we're wired differently, aren't mm -hmm. we? 
you both are, are chaplains and have, a, have talked to many people and, and pastors, et cetera, and the sensitivity about how one formula, does one formula or one size fit all? How does it work? You know, when I hear uh, <laughs> Jenny's story, there's a comfort in knowing that there isn't a formula. It's not a very neat process. I think mm -hmm. you were very open and uh, you like you use the word authentic a lot, and I think it's so meaningful. And I'd love for you to comment on what that means to you. But um, that each person have their own journey. The way you process forgiveness, not the way your parents did, Correct. Or your brother did, and uh, we sort of respect each other um, way to attain it. So God worked with you. Yes. And I think you're giving hope to other people that he'll work with them wherever they're at. I think that's mm -hmm. the only constant that we can have in the equation um, is is what God can do for each one of us. It, there's not a set timetable for either mm -hmm. one of us or any of us. It's it's a truly a unique experience. And for me to say, okay, Sabine, this is how it has to work for you if you're mm -hmm. ever in this situation or yeah. or if you're wanting to forgive anyone, that's that's not fair. There's not a human blueprint there's not a human timetable um but what is can, like i mentioned what can mm -hmm. be constant is how god can work within our hearts he knows what is going to work best for each one of us and in each of our situations and i think even if i were to be faced with a, a forgiveness situation again uh, whether it's as extreme as this or otherwise it it would probably be a little bit different Hmm. Let's let let's take and 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 cr and put a human face to the issue of timetables and approach. Mm -hmm. After David died, you had some conversations with your mom about her wishing she had have been there and and, yeah. and verbally been able to say the words. Right. But you were able to encourage her, weren't you? And, and what? How did God give you the words <laughs> to encourage her? I'd like to think that I encouraged her, but for me, my mom has been a, a witness. Um, in so many different ways. And I saw her forgiving David even before I said those words. Um, she would accept his collect calls. She would send him care packages and, and messages with whether letters or notes with expressions of God's love and acceptance. And those weren't things that she was just sending him to try to convert him. It was what she believed in mm -hmm. her heart that God loves and accepts everyone. And for me, that was a great example of how it is different for each one of us. Mm -hmm. You you mentioned in, in in your discussion that it's okay to be human on the journey to forgiveness. What do you mean by that? <laughs> I'll be the first to admit that I'm I'm human and I get angry mm -hmm. that my sister's not around anymore. But you know, the anger is is it that specific fact that she's not around anymore. I'm not angry at David and what he did to her. Sure that hurts. But I've released him. He does not have that hold on me anymore. And thank God for that, because I think that I could very easily be withdrawn into myself or, or bitter because of that. And I couldn't be an instrument for God in, in my life now for what he continues to call me to do and, and mm -hmm. represent him and to, to share with others. Mm -hmm. And for me, that says, that says a lot for how he can continue to help me to remember my sister in a positive light. Mm -hmm. How has it changed for you impacting uh, the the call on your life, you've you you're still healing from mm -hmm. this experience. Fourteen years later, yeah. still mm -hmm. on the journey of healing and mm -hmm. forgiveness. Yes. How is that? How is that uh, enhanced or enriched the calling God has on your life now? Um, I've I've learned that I have to be patient and and realize it is a journey. It's not something that I can just change overnight or, mm -hmm. or anything that I can even really have control over. Um, so it's I'm still learning that it's about surrendering to God. Um, I didn't even learn from the very beginning, like with the forgiveness and surrendering that to God, how that could help me as well with my grief journey. And I feel that the two overlap. They, mm -hmm. They're two separate journeys for me. They, they overlap at times. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm learning now as I reflect back and I can see where God's hand was in my forgiveness journey, how it helps me now with my grief journey, which now informs me as I help other people as a chaplain. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned that you didn't blame God for what had happened to right. your sister. Just to help for, for somebody who's not quite there or maybe is there, mm -hmm. give us um, a, an idea of what, what your relationship, how you related to God in that, in the midst of that pain. You, you know, that while I didn't blame him, I, I didn't rely on his strength. I, I, 
I felt like I had an inner strength and I thought he gave me this inner strength and I need to rely on that but I thought it was like I need to somehow make that strength work and it was when I started to realize it's a surrendering to his strength and it was his strength that he was su supporting me with that mm -hmm. has made the difference mm -hmm. but you know it it came over a period of time um no I didn't struggle with blaming God on it mm -hmm. but I know that um I didn't really allow him to embrace me with his love mm -hmm. and, and with his compassion. But once I did, that's where the transformation came within my heart mm -hmm. for the forgiveness. Well, I want to thank you, Jennifer, for sharing with us on Hope on Fire today. And thank you, Sabine. Forgiving those who have hurt or abused us is perhaps one of the most difficult aspects of healing. But without forgiveness, it may be impossible to ever find the beauty and purpose of the scars from our past. We hope you'll ask God to help you forgive and cut loose those old wrongs committed against you. And someday you'll be able to share those scars and others will see Jesus because you were not ashamed to show his glory in your healing. Thank you. Hope on Fire is produced by Livestreams Media, a listener supported ministry. To download a free copy of today's program or be a part of our social network, please visit our website at hopeonfire.org. You may also contact us by writing to Life Streams Media, P.O. Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Once again, that's Life Streams Media, P.O. Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida, 32860, or online at hopeonfire.org. Thank you so much for your letters and continued support. Until next time, may God set your hope on fire.